connecting to cloud server. All righty, we have started the recording. So welcome everybody and happy International Commedia dell'arte day. <laughs> it's February 25th, 2020. And we are here uh, with a whole bunch of really great Commedia brains. And we've got um, uh, with us today, five panelists, uh, uh, four panelists and me kind of trying to keep it organized. Uh, from a variety of different backgrounds, and we're going to talk about some of the things that can help people produce <laughs> more commedia, because the more commedia, the better, uh, in, my, in my mind. So, um, uh, who, you can see on the screen uh, the folks that have their video running. These are our panelists right now, and we've got a whole bunch of other great participants that are also with us today, and we're going to bring them in a little bit later. Uh, first, uh, you can see uh, our good friend Ollie Crick over in England. And the first time I got to know about Ollie, <laughs> so book. this is a, <laughs> this is a super great book, um, Commedia for Troops. And uh, you know, all of us are nodding. You're like, yes, this is a great book. It was awesome. So this is just the first piece of Ollie Crick I got to absorb and uh, really learn more about Commedia. So that was the first thing, and he's done a lot uh, since then. So we're going to learn about Ollie in a minute. Uh, Paul Adams is our good friend in Australia who has a great deal of experience with Shakespeare and also uh, some comedia experience within the Society of Creative Anachronism and a whole lot of managing artists experience. Uh, next you'll see Rachel Brun and Rachel is a, uh, a published author and a publisher and also another Shakespeare expert that has worked with a lot of comedia um, with me here in the Society for Creative Anachronism and also in community theater, uh, particularly with uh, Sweet Tea Shakespeare Company in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina and a bunch of other community theater groups. And so she's got a great experience there. And then there's uh, my dear friend, Paula Brinkman, also with us. And she and I grew up doing a lot of comedia together and uh, she also has some great experience in uh, community theater with the Mason Community Players in uh, uh, Dayton, Ohio. Mason, so, Ohio. Mason, which is near Dayton. Yeah, yeah. it's near Dayton. Okay. okay, somewhere very close in that corner of Ohio. Um, so these are our presenters today. We also have a handful of great folks that we're gonna hear from more later. Um, so I'm gonna start with asking Rachel to start us off and we have a basic structure where we're gonna talk about logistics and content when you're producing Commedia and some of the things she's seen work and not work so much. And um, uh, you guys introduce yourselves a little more detail about where you're coming from and what you can uh, speak from in your experience. So thanks a lot, Rachel, you get to start. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. <laughs> Third time was the charm on that one. Perfect. Um, so I don't know if I'm necessarily an expert on um, Shakespeare, but I have spent a lot of time working with groups that don't enjoy a whole lot of funding. <laughs> we, we don't really have a margin of error or a cushion of really anything, um, except sometimes homemade baked goods. So uh, what I often bring to groups that are trying to do things like a Shakespeare Comedia blend or the, the Sweet Tea Shakespeare group is an understanding of how to get a community, to put the community in community theater, um, to advertise without an advertising budget and the sorts of communications that troops can and really any kind of group can take on that fosters those connections even when you're not directly selling tickets. And this, um, these are things like we did uh, social media. So social media is a great one, but knowing how to use it in such a way that you are engaging rather than um, only ever posting the ask. Um, one of the things that works great is to try to maintain a balance between, hey, look at this cool picture from rehearsal. Hey, check out this spotlight on our 
cast member, on our crew member, hey, check out these professional photographs, throwback Thursdays, this and everything else. Oh, hey, by the way, can anybody help us load out? <laughs> there will be beer and, <laughs> and pizza and whatever might entice um, people to come on down and help you put large, heavy props into somebody's truck. Um, or to let you borrow the truck for the props. So again, it's it's really finding ways to communicate that get, that get people involved, that create a community and that create engagement even before you sell the that first ticket. And that is something that can work really well if done well. And then when we're looking at the not so much, if you if you start fostering only the ask, if it's only ever a call to action, like, hey, buy a ticket. Hey, can you donate money? Hey, does anybody have any towels or can do laundry for us? When it starts getting to that all the time, that's when it starts to work not so much. Um, and this is gonna be a theme with anything that I throw out there. It's gonna be, hey, this is a thing and it can work great, but it can also work not so much. That's awesome. You're right, Rachel. I love the ideas where you, you're using social media, particularly pictures from rehearsals, cast member focuses. We did that last summer with that Much Ado production in, in the uh, Women's Theater Festival in Raleigh. That's exactly what they did. It was great. I mean, I think it was great. I had a great time. <laughs> okay, that's super. Do you, do you want to pause there and move on to the next person? Or do you have another idea or two you want to share? Okay, we're going to move on. Paul, now you get to tell us a little bit about your background and then some ideas you think work great, not so great on the idea of logistics. Sure, um, yeah, so uh, I'm in Brisbane, Australia. It's a beautiful uh, late summer morning, 7.12 here. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased I didn't have to wake up at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my, my journey started as part of the Society for Creative Anachronism as well. So I fell in love with acting at school. And then when I left school, I went to university to get into some acting courses, but they wouldn't let me in. So I decided to uh, go into business and uh, ended up in the SCA as a hobby. And that's where I started cutting my teeth on producing Shakespeare and rallying large groups of amateur performers together to try and put shows up. And uh, that was a hoot. It was a real great fun time. And over a number of years, uh, ended up finally getting the chance to go professional as an actor. So I get to work as a professional actor in Brisbane now, which is great fun. And I've been producing professionally for a number of years now. So a lot of work for other people. I spent uh, about five years as the general manager of an independent theatre company here called the Queensland Shakespeare Ensemble, helping grow that business. And then my wife asked me to stop losing our money on shows that I produced for myself. And I went, ah, I should probably apply some of my business skills to my producing work. And so uh, the last few years have been about laying the foundations for that to get back out producing my own work, which is uh, started last year and we're, we're kicking off this year. And so that whole sense of uh, ground level marketing and, and getting out and building an audience from zero is, is very much in my mind at the moment. So, um, so that's kind of where I'm from and that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, so for me, Commedia has always been a love, 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 love the characters, love the, the structure of it. Um, logistics. Um, so for me, there's a couple of things, particularly when I agree with Rachel, more often than not, we're working with very low budgets. It's um, think big, but scale that back. So you don't have to think fancy, like dream big and think about what's the biggest thing we could achieve and then recontextualize that for the budget that you have. Um, I think it's really important for us to not be limited in our thinking by the budget. So don't start with what we have. I really like to encourage people to think big and then how can we achieve something like that with the budget that we have? So it might not be as flashy and as fancy, but you can get some really amazing things happening with, uh, with big ideas and, and you can cheat. <laughs> you can cheat your way through logistics more often than not to, to get a really great effect. So um, think big, but don't think fancy, I think is, is a phrase that I like to use. So um, I am really passionate about letting actors play um, through rehearsals. Um, there is, you know, one of the beautiful things about Commedia is the, the community sense and that collaboration that comes 
and the freedom of the improvisation and for me really allowing actors to go down that like follow a line of thought and and sometimes they get scared to do that and so i will push them to keep pursuing a line of thought until it is exhausted because there are some ridiculous ludicrous just hilarious things that can come out of that so um that's one thing for me is don't don't restrict people in rehearsals really let them play and just see where an idea can go because you will never know what might come out of that so and that for me um from a rehearsal point of view has really helped add a lot of freedom for the actors to um, explore but also feel safe doing that and and you get some really great moments from that sort of thing and the only other, the other point that i just wrote down when i was sort of thinking about this was always consider where your audience is at um, consider it from their point of view you know what's what what is the audience what's going to work for them in regards to you know location time that sort of thing so think about who you're trying to target uh, who you're presenting for and and just from the logistical point of view think about them uh, a lot when you're shaping up where and when and how um, you're going to do the show. So a couple of little thoughts there. That's beautiful. I got to ask, do you have an example of something you've done and you've lived that was thinking big and you had some big idea like total world domination and then you made it not fancy and it worked out great? Yeah. Um, almost everything I do <laughs> like for now, like right now, my, my journey has turned to building an empire for myself, you know, which is about getting regular theater work happening and producing consistently. And so, you know, I've got a very big picture of what I want that to look like in regards to um, scope, um, scope and size and all that kind of stuff. And, but then being able to scale that back to, well, what, what do I need to do first? What's the, the first step to that? And so, you know, when we're producing a show, um, I'll have this big vision of the world that we want to create. And then our show is just a small part of that world. So I think that's probably actually a really useful um, one to start with is what's, what's the entire world that this show lives in? And then how do I contextualize this particular part of that world so that we can know what's happening beyond the, the things that we see in front of us and help us reference a, a bigger world and help our audience imagine something bigger in, in the sort of idea of the world that we're creating. But that gives us a little bit more of a contextualized focus for where we are now. So I don't know if that answered the question. I hope it helps. Oh, that does, that does. In fact, it gets me thinking in terms of, in the SCA, we kind of try to recreate a pre-1600 environment and you know many different eras and times and locations uh, but with commedia we try to say imagine yourself in a you know 16th century italian ish area maybe it's florence 1580 and within that you're telling a story through the commedia play of what life could be like you might be an audience member on the street in the marketplace and then we present this little play to you and it's a piece of life but we're trying to sort of recreate the whole vision of a reenacted piece of history so i think i mean that's what i'm getting cool. out of it right. <laughs> a piece of that that's exciting that's really um love that that's um uh that that gets me thinking and getting me creative i love it so um, let's move on to Paula, uh, Paula Brinkman, Brinkman from the uh, um, uh, Mason Community Players and Iskan Dali. Uh, so go ahead and uh, give us a little more background, Paula, on what you've been doing and uh, some more ideas about logistics. Okay, can you, everybody hear me? Yep, gotcha. Okay, good. Um, I don't, wow, some really great stuff so far. I don't know how much I can add. Let me give you a 30 second bio. Um, I have a degree in theater, a degree in English. I was introduced in, to Commedia by my beloved Dr. Mellish, who spent about 30 minutes on it once and all four of the drama majors and I said, wow, why isn't anybody doing this stuff? <laughs> and thank God I found Sophie and went, oh my God, somebody's doing this stuff. So we did this stuff. <laughs> we did this stuff. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm not saying shit. 
no, no, no. I said, we're doing this stuff. <laughs> it's yeah. good. We're doing it. <laughs> um, some things that I've found that have helped at least with East Kendali, um, and tailing to the SCA, um, outfit is one of the things I think that has helped us to, when we were more active was consistency. Um, we were never any city other than Ravenna. So we didn't expect the audience to learn a bunch of Italian cities. We always had Pantalone's house off stage left and Dottori's house stage right. And Spain was through the audience. So um, to try to make it as easy for the audience as possible. Um, one of the best, I think, successes that we had came out of necessity and desperation was our annual naughty show <laughs> that um, be, that we've had a couple of different times where it would say um, where where I had as a director I had uh, actors who had not read the scenario two hours before ca curtain and so you tell the audience outright we're half drunk hope you are too um, <laughs> we do this once a year enjoy <laughs> but we're gonna throw it all caution to the wind 18 and over only once a year and it was as close as we got to doing anything period um i think that's all i've got for at this point just i feel really overmatched okay. <laughs> no you Moving actually on. got me really think you got me thinking and you were you're mentioning something that makes me think of what paul was just saying about uh consider your audience's point of view and where's your audience coming from one of the things that iskandali was doing and being consistent is, you know, asking this bunch of pretty much typical Americans in the middle of Midwest USA uh, to not learn a bunch of new uh, Italian words. You know, a few, yeah. Ravenna is a city that's in the Italian city states many, many centuries ago. Uh, Ravenna is one good thing. Pantalone's house is over there, everything else is over there. And when someone comes in from Spain, it's coming in from the audience. Those are all very consistent things that I really think make the audience stress out less um, and they get, they get comfortable. So you're thinking in terms of what does the audience need? Um, and, you know, I think we, we did that a lot and it was, it was mostly, you know, it was to help us get to learn the art a lot better, but I think it also helped the audience to just sort of relax once they learned Ravenna was the city we were in and that was happening all the time. That, that was good. Don't need to really know where Padua is or anything else. So that's awesome. Thank you. Super. Um, alrighty. So Ollie, uh, let's move on to you. When you are thinking about logistics, what do you think about? Oh, and uh, please do uh, give us a good introduction of yourself more than just you wrote one of my favorite books. Thank you. Um, uh, I was introduced to Commedia in about um, in a few words at university, and it set something off in my head. Um, having left university, uh, I did lots and lots of, or, or as much as physical training in theatre as I could, clowning, eccentric dance, and stuff like that. And met a lot of people doing what they call Commedia, which in, which was very very different from itself. Um, lots of people saying it was this, lots of people saying it was that. Um, most people having heard a bit and then and then basing their performance on the bit that reinforced their own values. Um, so they, um, we're, you know, and I was still going, it's got to be something different than that. Um, or it's got to be something more than that. Um, met these guys called the Unfortunati who were art students from Liverpool who had trained with Carlo Bozo entirely by chance. Um, they were looking at doing a course on functional art in their third year. And, and had come across the Oreglia book, um, and um, and had and had done a show as a piece of performance art, but then they noticed that Carlo Bosso was teaching a course, and they went and did the course, and and they learned seven to two masters um, as taught move by move from the piccolo, and um, because they were art students, they could make stuff. So when I saw them from a Covent Garden their acting ability wasn't up to much but their masks were extraordinary their trestle stage was beautiful and their costumes were amazing and i was being a, i was i was being an uh, i was being an anarchist juggler at the time going you know damn theater where we're just doing 
street stuff, you know, for money. I was going, oh, hang on, that's actually theatre. So I played with them for a bit um, and and taught them impro, like in a Keith Johnson style, so they could like that. And we kind of had a, a parallel uh, trajectory for a bit, and I joined. Uh, I ended up teaching at drama schools in London and stuff. Um, and my and my relationship with Commedia is I know it obviously, which we share with everyone here, that it's the greatest theatre form ever, and it's just the rest of the world is too damn foolish to realise this. Um, <laughs> So it's up to us to be humble and and to actually find out why it was great. And for a bit, I had this company, well, for 10 years, I had this company called the Fabulous Old Spot Theatre Company. Um, Old Spot is a Gloucestershire pig. Um, um, and we toured, um, and fabulous, because damn it, man, we're fabulous. Um, and... Um, I got, I, got, I got very lucky in the sense I met an artistic director of the local producing house theatre who used to farm out their community tour every year to a different local theatre company because they couldn't be bothered with it. And they, um, you know, they did big house theatre and didn't want to sit in a van, which is kind of actually my idea of heaven. Where are we going? Where are we going? What's happening here? Um, and so they let us do a comedy show and so okay you know okay so you get a chance and it's all funded and everyone's paid so i got to choose a bunch of actors who'd done a workshop with me from okay from actors um from this actors uh, this weekly actors training thing um we borrowed a stage um from the old unfortunate people got some costumes together from the everyman's kit and we did a show um which we called hot crackling um which went very well because our theory was if we don't go too rude and we tell a good story and and we have lot and we have a lots of nice i know singing and some silly action and a monster um and all that stuff then you know someone's gonna like some of it um and that lasted 10 years we did sorry no it lasted about 10 years that we did about 10 shows over that year mm eight out of ten were comedia one was a film noir like murder mystery but um it was it was really comedia it was just you know the moves were different um and we had lots more black and white and up lighters um and began to find a way of work and it was all done um and because i was being a house husband at the time the rules were the self-imposed rules was you had to be home you had to be home that evening because you're taking the kids to school in the morning. Um, and I was very lucky in front of the Gloucestershire had a very, very strong network of actually village halls. And it actually works better than theatres because you can do a village hall in one village um, and then you can do, I don't know, like a village hall only five miles away the following night. Um, hey, Ollie, for us Yanks, yes. can you tell us what a village hall is? Oh, a village hall is a community centre. Right, there's a village oh, right. and in the middle okay. of it, there is a, you know, there is a hall that, you know, I know some rich person built about 150, 200 years ago that now has mothers and babies and yoga and kind of, you know, belly dancing tap and, you know, and yeah. the local party in it. And awesome. they all have their user groups and they all have their audiences. And um, so we basically toured them um, and you make contact with the committee. Um, you explain what you're doing. And then you have a financial argument with them and they go, oh, you know, um, which you normally end up with some kind of box office split, 70-30. Sometimes you can get a bet. Sometimes there are arts organisations that will give you a subsidy. Um, the Tories have killed all that, um, but I'm not doing that in a minute. Um, and from our first tour, which was 10 shows, our last tour was 70. So... Um, so we were seasonal, I think, professional with that. We toured with four actors and me as lighting technician, a director, stage manager. Um, we, 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 we earned an okay living from it. It wasn't good, but we made, we made money doing it. Things we learned, some village, every community was different. There was about five halls that once they'd had us once, they'd go, you're coming back. Um, and we wouldn't have to do any publicity. We'd just make a phone call, um, and they'd do all the phoning. Some people you really had to bombard with leaflets and stuff, but once you got an audience, they were nice people. 
Um, telling people that it was Commedia dell'arte initially was a mistake because people, this, this, is, this is the general public in, I know, Nowheresville, you know, Gloucestershire, you know, backslash Arkansas. Um, so, um, you know, we have rustic hillbillies here. Um, and if you say Commedia, people have a, people don't quite know what it is. So they think, is it Art Deco Piro? Is it, you know, is it bawdy? Or they just think it's a bit posh. So I thought we didn't call it that. We called it theatre from the merry England that never was. Um, or we called it, um, you know, family friendly, inclusive theatre. There is no word in the English language that says family friendly, inclusive and means it positively. Right. It just sounds wet. It's, it sounds like the kind of thing, you know, you send your kids to and grandpa and grandma have to go. It's not a family thing. Um, and we learned never to mention masks because if you said, and it's got masks, they'd go, won't that frighten the children? Um, and the correct answer being, yes, of course, that's the idea, is not <laughs> what bookers really want to hear. But no one complains about the mask afterwards. So, so kind of that's negotiating with it. We found that all, because we're a strange theatre company doing a self-devised show, the audience have heard that we're funny, but they don't know. So there's always an area of negotiation happens before the show begins um so we always had the actors selling programs or in costume but not in character welcoming the audience in not overtly not as a big deal it's their hall we are the invaders um so it's the actors meeting the audience before they have to perform and chatting with them with then you know and selling them shit um you know programs and whatever um then we'd sing a few songs you know, harmonies and stuff like that. So our, so we're kind of slowly building up our cred as kind of, you know, they might be funny. And then when the last person was in, which was sometimes half an hour before the show was due to begin, sometimes half an hour after, because some, sometimes people get there early to get a good seat. Some people go, oh, they'll be late, mate, and just turn up. Um, then we get on stage and we do a number. So it goes song, song, wobble, 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 song number, and then the show begins. So there's always a negotiation. The interval we said can't be longer than three quarters of an hour because they'll have forgotten what happened in the first half, but the interval flexible time was actually dependent on the bar or the needs of a community. Because what we were selling ourselves on was, we are a community event, walk to the theater with your neighbors and with your friends, enjoy yourself. So we were also selling it as a chance you know, for the community to give out, you know, parish notices, have a rough, you know, have a raffle, you know, raise funds, sell cakes, um, argue with the neighbours about who chopped down whose tree and all that kind of frightening stuff. We've Twice we had shows that started with a minute silence for a kid being run over in the, lo in, in the local road, which is kind of awfully sad, but a bit shit when you're trying to start a comedy show. Um, you know, it's kind of like, okay. But it also reminds you that, you are, this is what Carlo Bozo always says, that you are servants of the audience. You know, we are coming to entertain them. Um, the hard work was we had to turn this uh, village hall into a theatre every night, so we travelled with our own small lighting rig, our own trestle stage. The good thing always is, in terms of logistics, you're always performing on the same, on the same space. So, a show, so you don't always lose 5% or 10% of the actors' concentration on every show because where am I coming on from? You know, oh my God, where's X in this particular hall? Um, so, and out of, and the other thing before, I, I'm sorry, I talk a lot, oh, the other important thing we discovered from that, or rather we theorised at the beginning and then found that it worked, um, which is a problem with Shakespeare as well, is that if someone says, I am King Valentino, the whole audience goes, what? You know, there is a problem with the names and there is a problem with the locations. It acts as a barrier. So we, what we did, and this is in the, this is about my chapter in the Routledge Companion, was instead of going, right, Pantalone is always from Venice, he's from Venice. We, I looked at the whole, I looked at, at the relationship between the comedic characters as an ecosystem. Like there's a there's an intellectual boss, there's a there's a there's a money making boss, there's there's aristocracy, there's servants, and we are what and they all came from a particular place within northern Italy, and I, I call it embodied locality. Like 
you know, everyone, as soon as Pantalone appears, everyone goes, Venetian, <laughs> right, because everyone in North Italy knows. Now, that's something that doesn't happen when Pantalone appears as Pantalone in England. Everyone goes, who? Right, but everyone hates a good farmer. <laughs> right. You know, a farmer, get off my land. You know, in English folk, so Pantalone, so we made a guess that Pantalone was a, was a local landowning farmer with a daughter. <laughs> And it moved it more into a folkloric area. So once you've nailed Pantalone, and, and we called him Titus Dallymore, and when we turned out an actor chose the name, and it turned out that Dallymore was the local name, was the name of a local family of criminals in Gloucestershire. It's like, thank you, thank you, we don't want to go there. So, so he became Titus Dallymore, and then, and then Florence Dallymore was his daughter, and then, um, and then, so we, okay, we've got a family, and we know where they live, and they're in the posh, you know, farming belt, of Gloucestershire. So all the Zannies are their workers, and then Brigella becomes the innkeeper who's always trying to score feeble points off his, off his landlord. And suddenly the role of Brigella makes sense if it's someone who's always got a chip on his shoulder because there's somebody with more money than him who's always thwarting his schemes. And because you place them in different bits of Gloucestershire, like there's a, there's a very posh Regency town of Cheltenham, it's a bit like Bath, but smaller. Um, the aristocrats came from there. Um, anyone who was a hated outsider, you know, came from London, you know. Um, you know, and there's a very bizarre place just across the river called the Forest of Dean, which has been historically isolated. You know, it's a bit like the Ozarks, you know, in the sense of people who come from there have, you know, odd, odd family relations that don't bear scrutiny. Um, and we have the Forest of Dean. So there's, you know, there's all sorts of nutters you can have coming from the Forest of Dean. Um, and, and one of our best jokes was Jack, our hero, was kind of trying to protect a baby from spies and we said, right, I'm going to the Forest of Dean. No one will dare follow me there. Right? And that got a laugh from all the people on the non-forest side who went, yeah, because they're mad in there. And everyone in the Forest of Dean went, from there, went yeah, because we're odd. So, you know, you're trying to play on them, play on those areas. And so we found that lo locating within a geographical area, all the characters made an immediate connection with your audience, you know, and that's in terms of the accents, because we're all very, well, some of us are quite, you know, PC and polite and we don't, and we don't tease people from where they come from, however much they deserve it sometimes. Um, but as soon as somebody speaks, as soon as somebody, as soon as, so if I came on and gave a lecture in America, you know, like this, it would be either, oh, he's posh English, amazing, or, you know, toffee nose monarchist, you have a visceral reaction to that. And that's what happens. That's, I think, because my other incarnation is doing a PhD in studying what the dramaturgy, you know, why was Commedia so good so early? Why did it last? And it's because you never had to the cut to the chase. You had a, a, an image of a character and, a sh and an accent, and you immediately got a, and you immediately went, oh yeah, he's one of them stupid mountain people from Bergamo. He's going to have, you know, hi there, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> you know, and immediately, you know, all our primal judgment kicks in, but we're far too polite to say it. But it's part of why we have the, I mean, it, it runs, it runs counter to our good sense of social human beings, but as constructors of comedy with a reasonable intelligence, we can make use of that. Like everyone gets a happy ending, right? Is an ironic, who, whichever states that, which is an ironic thing because, you know, you go, they, they would never get a happy ending, man. They would, you know, everyone would just rip them off and then, and then throw their body in the creek. But, <laughs> You know, um, you know, them oh, alligators. I tell you, I love I've, I've got to shut up now. Accents. No, no, no. I'm going to ask you to talk more um, in, uh, well, it's not in just, just me, a minute people, because I want to check in with the other people here before we run out of time. But I love what you're saying about the accents. That's always something that has confused the Dickens out of me um, because I don't know what, you know, accents are like from Bergamo. And, well, that's. Uh, See, I would say to you, that's irrelevant, right? Okay, because that only, well, I was thinking, 
is I was looking at why the historical command, why, you know, why is Harlequin from Bergamo? Why is Pantaloni from Venice? It's because they were all within like a day's travel of each other. You know, so it's, you know, it's like, so people in Turin where all the nice aristocrats knew that everyone else was uneducated scum. You know, so they, you know, because, you know, you know they spoke the language of Petrarch, you know, and Dante, yeah. they were the posh people, you know, yeah. you know, and then, and, and then Venice, which is basically a swamp with palaces on it, you know, based on trade, yeah. you know, where they were out to make money out of everyone, out of everyone else, because that's the only way Venice could survive, you know, and there'd been so many famines, you know, so, so what we did with Old Spot was we tried to work out what the visceral reaction you know would be i mean it can get close to it can get close to racism you know but it's kind of so i've kind of got this rule that every character that's like that you but for you kind of almost you can you've got five ways that you big yourself up as a role then you've got five ways that you big you know that you put yourself down you know, so, you know, but it's always better to have, you know, the evil guy actually save the world at the end because, you know, deep down, you know, they're a nice guy and it's a genuine surprise. Yeah. You know, you know, it's the Scooby-Doo ending. It's fantastic, isn't it? Someone takes the mask off and goes, actually, I am your father and I'm keeping an eye on you and I love you. And of course you can marry him. Goes, <laughs> oh, 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 that's nice. You know, you know, that's what, you know, you're making a big world when big, stupid, whenever, when, the, when half the joke is that the whole cast believe that's true. And the mm. audience is going, cheap trick. But the audience, mm. you know, but the, you know, but the, but all the actors are going, that's amazing. I never saw through that disguise. My liege. <laughs> oh my you know, God, so, I love it. I, so, I so, love it. So it's kind of, you know, but they, the, anyway, yeah. So accents, so it's kind of, it's what I, so I, so it worked within Gloucester. We did, we did something similar in Manchester with another group, which is an urban thing. Um, and that was quite, what was quite interesting there was we managed to pick accents from Manchester, from different areas of Manchester, um, of different socio-economic classes. Okay, Commedia is Marxist, get, get this. Okay, in terms of it actually, you know, there are social classes and all the comedy is through the interaction between the econ different economic states of them, um, you know, whatever. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, I know, I just lost myself there. Got excited. <laughs> no worries. Well, I tell you what, I want to check in with everybody else real quick on content because you were doing a great job of giving us some wonderful logistics stuff i mean honestly i've had similar experiences trying to educate the audience about what's commedia in the first place so if you just start throwing the word commedia dell'arte out there at an audience that doesn't know what that is they might think it's like in your words it's too posh or too body and not for me whatever they think it is, you know, so. Well, they I saw San Francisco mind trip and thinks it's Marxism and revolution. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I'm not seeing that, God damn it. Sorry. Exactly. Well, I loved your idea where you called it theater from the merry England that never was. That's right, that gives you a lot of scope. Yeah, you know, we could always call it, you know, just oldie time theater. You know, and, and like yeah, yeah. something very general. And, well, the uh, best comment we ever got from a member of the audience was, oh, you guys are like Shakespeare, but funny. You know, which is a bit unfair on Shakespeare, but, you know, <laughs> there's the language to deal with. <laughs> okay, Paula has an idea. Well, when I teach uh, Commedia 101 at SCA events, mm -hmm. I usually lead with, this is not Shakespeare. This is what Shakespeare would have gone to see at a bachelor party. And that can usually get people in. Yes, no, that's good. That's good. It's not, it's, yeah, yeah, no, that's good. That's good. I mean, I'd look at, I'd look at this thing, the jig, you, you, you know, the Elizabethan jig is J I double G E mm -hmm. performed after the straight play. It was like a 30 minute and a bawdy comedy in rhyming couplet with lots of, with lots of dances, which mm -hmm. was part of the deal. If you want to go and see King Lear, 
immediately after it, there was, you know, Kemp and Sons did the funnies, you know, after it. So you kind of go, um, and some of those, you know, were as rude as, but it was all blokes in drag and a bit weird, you know, for our sensibilities. So some um, of the things about content that you mentioned is uh, tying it into the community. And that ties into what Rachel was talking about, making yes. it a community event. And one of the things that we've always liked doing is when we go to a different town, you look at, you try to find out ahead of time, what are the names of families that are? Yeah, yeah. And what are the names of people that are a big deal in that community? And you work them in. And one of my favorite examples is we have a friend, uh, Drea Lead, who you might know, she's a, a costuming genius um, and does great uh, period corsets. And so we mentioned Mistress Dre corset shop where everything is half off. Mm. It was a cute or joke. Everybody in her community loved it. And, yeah. you know, so that kind of joke is a one, one liner, but like mentioning characters as part of the community that are committee characters, but using names of the locals, like you were saying. Um, yeah, uh, include uh, them. Include them. Location. And, um, associating it with your characters. That's well, we, always had an we always had a, an, a, an incident in a pub or in a bar in our shows, and it was always the local bar. So you'd always try and, you know, find a few local references to there. Yep. Or um, in our first show, we had a beast that used to terrorize the neighborhood. And it was always, you know, the beast of the local wood, you know, <laughs> or the place where nobody would go. So it became the beast of Horsley Dump once which was the local reclamation <laughs> center you know oh everybody, God, everybody goes, oh. you know and sometimes you get it really wrong and you just move on and sometimes you get it really right but I, well, <laughs> yeah, my, my attitude to that is you can do it on the surface you can mention one or two names but it, it sometimes sometimes you kind of got to just be a little bit sensitive to both actors memory there's one show we had three pubs in it so if 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 we moved outside Gloucestershire, they were going, what? You know, we had to immediately find out what these three new places were and include them in random verbal Latsy. You know, you can see hatred from the actors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but also it's got that something, there's got to be something real about it because mm -hmm. when audiences will sense sometimes if you're just patronizing them, you know, mm. it, uh, you know, it's, I mean, you know, it's absolutely necessary to include them Mm -hmm. You know, like just it's a long way to get here from, and you know, and the yeah, you know, and the mm -hmm. freeway or the whatever it is mm -hmm. was always jammed with horses at this time mm -hmm. of night. You know, everyone goes, Oh, yeah, that road's crap, yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to so check in with the rest yeah. of you guys yeah. and ask you for your ideas on content, just like Ollie was saying, these are the things that engage an audience. Mm. So, um, I know we always we've we've all talked about the um, uh. Uh, you know, naming something lo local uh, in the show. So I'm going to start back around at the beginning with Rachel and see if you've got more ideas in that train of thought on content that engages the audience. And then we're going to move to Paula and then Paula, and then we're going to open it up for more Q&A. So um, just one quick note, if I suddenly shut down and take off, it's because I got to go pick up my youngest for, or my oldest from school. Um, but what I was going to kind of mention is the fact that in the SEA, one of the things that's really great is that it's already a community of people who have an interest in, his, in the historical stuff. So when we were doing um, Twelfth Night as a comedia play, we had musicians who knew what a galliard was, but were also significant, um, talented enough to turn a modern song into a galliard for our Commedia Shakespeare performance. So we were able to connect with some of those, um, I guess the best word for it would be maybe, maybe meme, those, those, those things that we all kind of recognize and can take advantage of. Um, the scheming innkeeper can just as easily be like a scheming autocrat or a scheming apprentice. I mean, we have our own archetypes that we can use. Um, again, I'm going to reference the, the Commedia Twelfth Night. When we looked at Sir Toby and we looked at Sir Andre 
Sir Andrew Akujigbella and Mariah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and Mariah. And we said, oh, wait, no, here's those, those characters are comedic characters. Shakespeare took them and went, and he basically changed some of the names and gave them a posh accent, or maybe a slightly less than posh accent. Um, so we in the SCA also have our own archetypes, our own things that we can both play with and maybe poke fun of, depending on how political we want to get at the time. Um, so I, I think that there's definitely a lot of opportunities for those things. You know what? And, and I'm not even above bringing in a Baby Yoda reference because <laughs> contemporarily, <laughs> um, just, just again, to find those moments of reference. But I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that's yeah, great. You're a community. I, yeah. So you reference things within it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we should do more of that. <laughs> okay, Paul, go ahead. Uh, yeah, look, much the same, really. The notes that I had written down are, are essentially a reflection of what we've already heard. Um, I love the concept uh, that both Ollie and Paula spoke about in regards to setting up the framework, you know, that you're, you're creating through the logistics of, you know, the staging of, you know, Pantalone's house is always over there or, you know, we're, we're in this particular town. Uh, I think that's really great for helping the audience break the ice for them, like to, to help get them in a bit quicker. So that just, you know, that just removes one whole obstacle to getting them invested in the show. And, and, and for me, it was much the same in that, um, you know, we will contextualize it to the audience that's there and, you know, play on those stereotypes that we know exist. So in the SCA audiences, you know, we'll have a knight who's, you know, the Capitano of his world in that, you know, he thinks he's the best fighter in the world, but everyone knows he's a bit crap and, you know, play on those stereotypes and find the, the things that everybody talks about secretly in the background and bring them to light. And, you know, the, 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 the seam checker uh, costume maker, you know, who, who has to check everyone's hems for perfection and that kind of thing. So we play on those stereotypes all the time and they work really well. <laughs> I love, I love, love, love the idea of when you're traveling town to town, contextualizing it locally, but taking it to the point of accents. I, I hadn't even considered that. I think that's fantastic because it, again, it's an instant connection. And I, I think that concept of creating that visceral response is so yes. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just mm -hmm. genius. The, it, so, it means so. you're not doing Chekhov. Yeah. You know, kind of, you're, yeah. Yeah. No, I, um, I think it's, it's a, a really gestus. It's yeah. Instant. And it's an easy way to contextualize. I mean, you could even do that with Shakespeare and that sort of thing. I think that's where people struggle with some of the period texts is that how do I contextualize this for a modern audience? And, and they sometimes go too far, but I think finding those, those things that are relevant to that audience and contextualizing it that way is genius and accents are a big way to do that. Um, but yeah, start playing on the stereotypes that people are already thinking about for me is, is a big play. We do that a lot. Um, we, and, and when you're in a closed community, so whether you're going to a particular um, village or whether you're in a particular audience like an SCA audience or, you know, a local community somewhere, I, I think playing on some in-jokes that, you know, like Ollie, what you talked about with the, the highway gag, you know, oh, it's always, yeah. you know, being able to know. And you see stand-up comedians do that today in their, in their work, you know, when they they're touring from place to place and they'll do that research and find out what mm. the local people think about, you know, what's the biggest thing that people whinge about here. And then they'll write a joke about that. Now I think, you know, that, those connection points help, you know, really connect an audience to it. So um, two things for me that I wrote down on top of that were don't be afraid of simple storylines or ideas. I think sometimes people can overcomplicate things and sometimes the simplest thing works the best and to, to not go too crazy in complexity because sometimes the complexity will come from the relationships. You don't need to make the storyline complex. They can be really simple. So don't be afraid to adopt and embrace a simple storyline or a simple concept because that can really help. It's, um, yes, it's pair of lovers meet and they get interrupted. Yep, that's, that's it. it. <laughs> it's, it's so many, it's like uh, always start with that for me. That's like, right. So generally this is going to be you're that person's daughter, you love him and your dad hates him. So let's go from there. And so, then, right. you know, it's just so much really of it starts from that point. Yeah. yeah. So I think, 
keeping it simple can then allow you the depth into the relationships, which is fun. Um, the thing I found sometimes that hasn't worked is when people reference something, they're trying to make a, 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 a reference to something modern or contemporary to help bring that connection point in. But um, for me, I've seen it not work where they get too specific. Like you might reference the orange president or the orange leader, you know, or we're, we're mastered by an orange, but don't mention Trump's name. You know, you might, that might take it too far. I've seen a Canada show where, you know, we're in a medieval setting and someone mentioned a modern political person and it just took you right out of the moment. Yeah, yes, yeah, no, absolutely. It kills, it kills the belief, the odd, well, it kills the game in the audience's head yeah, that they absolutely. are in, you know, that they are in Never Never Land. Yeah, Kakala Bosso used to say, okay, we can't say nuclear energy, but we can say the new power the doctor invented. Yes. Yeah, you know, reference those right, things. You know, don't be specific. Yeah, yeah, and everyone and everyone goes, oh, I know what that is, and they're all clever because they made it up in their own heads. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Spot on. I think that's a great example. So, yeah, and that was the only other thing that I had just sort of jotted down in regards to content. Just yes, contextualize, but yeah. be careful of being too specific. Yeah, you know, we've had those kinds of discussions um, in in my troops all, for years. You know, when do we bring in? A, a reference to something that's a really good joke, but it's totally modern, 100%. You know, like, I love the idea of bringing in a Baby Yoda joke, but how do you do that and not actually break the spell? You know? It's you call him a goblin. Yeah. Oh, he's a goblin, but he talks like Yoda. You know, he's green and pointy. <laughs> that's cute. See? Yeah, you gotta get creative about it. Mm. So, I wanna... Paula, uh, Baby, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need a minute. Then someone cuts his head off and throws it off, you know. <laughs> mm, that's changed the world a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paula, um, your last thoughts on uh, on content, and then I want to um, open it up to a couple other people that are still hanging out with us. I I only have just maybe two little tiny things to add that worked for us. Um, we actually had a couple of seasons where we had a little girl in the cast mm. and it was a huge success audience wise content wise she started with one line ugly hats for sale that was it and the kid raised more money for us than the rest of us combined um try to labor this is, <laughs> yeah and the other thing that's worked fairly well for us uh, but used very not generously, very sparsely, is a little bit of mixing of genres. Um, like the time we threw a tiara and a um, fairy skirt onto the pantalone. No, mm -hmm. not pantalone, I'm sorry, the spavento, and turned him into a fairy godfather. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do that for a whole show. You can do it for one scene. Mm -hmm. um, that's it, I'm done, over. Okay, that's beautiful. Um, I love it, you guys. Thank you so much. Now, we're going to go about five minutes over because I want to make sure to check in with the, the three guests that we still have uh, with us. I think Rachel had to go pick up her child, so uh, she checked out. Uh, but uh, first of all, I want to invite, uh, we've got three folks. I see your names. We got Jay, and he's an old friend, and then Amanda Garland, and then Andre Pierre. So I'm going to start with Jay. Jay, uh, go ahead and turn on your video if you've got it. And um, if you've got some other ideas along these lines, uh, go ahead and share them. And uh, if questions you want to throw out there, do that. We got about another. We could get all five or ten minutes over time. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll be quick. Um, so the thing I I'm more interested in is that uh, if you're trying to do one of these shows on a shoestring budget, uh, the the biggest problem we always have is getting it together to promote it, right? That um, if you want to have an audience show up, um, back back when we were doing 18 shows a year, we'd, we'd have kind of a built-in audience, but you know now we're doing about four or five a year. And um, the, you know, we don't have two or 300 people that are gonna show up at every show anymore. And, uh, you know, so what do you do to, to publicize and how do you bring in new people you know, the, there's a few things, right? So you go to the local library and, and do a show for them or something during their, 
you know, cultural night or something, but, uh, or do something for the Boy Scouts or, you know, what, what have you. But, you know, we just, that means you have to do more shows, which at this point we're, you know, we're not doing fewer because we're not in demand. We're just doing fewer because we're old. And um, <laughs> the, uh, now. It's nice young actresses. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, so watch our most recent video. We have two of those. <laughs> but um, so that's, that's one issue. And the other thing that, you know, so I'm not getting an answer for that, but, but maybe, maybe you guys will coaxed. think about it. And, maybe it's just a tagline. It's like coaxed out of retirement one more time. <laughs> well, but we have to even, we have to think far enough ahead to yeah. like go to some media and distribute it. Right. And this is like, do you print stuff up and, and go out on the street corner or. Jake, can, or, I, can I throw an idea at you on that? Yes, please. Yeah, um, so something I'm doing locally to build my audience is actually finding complementary businesses that, you know, are serving the same kind of target market. So for me at the moment, I'm focusing on building shows for kids in primary school. So I'm looking at anyone and everyone from an organizational point of view that serves that audience. And rather than spending money upfront on marketing, I'm actually approaching them at the moment going, hey, I need to build my audience. I'm really trying to get in front of the same people that you're serving. Um, is there a chance that maybe you can promote this show and then I pay you a small referral fee from every ticket that's sold that comes from your audience? And so rather than marketing up front, I get to pay for that after someone's actually paid for the ticket. So, and it might only be a few dollars per ticket, but for someone that might be a way to, um, yeah. you know, like I'm looking at local PNC connected for primary schools because they're always looking for funds and fundraising. So that kind of thing. That's that sounds great. So, so, yeah. If I can throw in a what we're using for amazing community players, um, we're killing two birds with one stone by knowing enough of our season in advance that I went to go see the importance of being earnest last week. My ticket for earnest was actually a business card for the next show with performance dates. So yeah, that gives not, you that demands way more advance notice than we have. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great, great one and plan out your whole year if you can plan it out so you can do that kind of stuff i don't i don't I'm a, I'm a cynic i don't think there are tricks i think there's if you're doing four shows a, if you're doing 10 shows a year or four it's the same amount of publicity you know it's just that you're doing the same amount of well for to get in for less shows you know you know it's kind of they have well, we had our, our natural following for such a long time. And then when we dropped off, the, so did the following. All right, I'd a, like to you interrupt you guys just real mail? quick and to okay. see if Andre okay. Pierre has uh, a, something to share. He was just uh, sending us a little chat that says hi. He's said it's a great conversation and he logged out. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you guys got a lovely hello from uh, Andre Pierre. I don't really know where he's from, uh, but he said, uh, happy Comedia Day. Thanks for a great conversation. Um, so one last thing, I want to check in with Amanda Garland. She's our last guest that uh, hasn't checked in yet. I'd love to see if she's got a, um, a video, if you've got a, if you can unmute yourself. Say hi, Amanda. Uh, Let's see if you've got any questions. I'm, I'm trying. They are, can you see me? I can. Hi, Amanda. Hi. You are on Hi. the recording, so uh, you know, be yeah. polite. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I came in on this because I'm an old friend of Ollie's. I did a lot of oh, wow. community theatre when I was younger, and uh, I've been a mum, and uh, now I'm being a carer for my 96-year-old mum-in-law. So I haven't performed for a little while, but I, I teach. I teach singing and drama, and really? but um, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so uh, very interesting chat. When I think back to our shows that we did as a community theatre company, we did one year, for example, I made I brokered a deal in Wales. In Wales has hundreds of castles, and I brokered a deal with Cadu, which is the um, the alternative in Wales to the English heritage people that care for those buildings, and mm -hmm. they let us tour to. I don't know how many we did, maybe 40, 45, something like that, all summer, just jumping in and out of a van and getting out all our costume and set and setting up and sometimes hanging onto the set as we did the show because the wind was coming through the, you know, the castle keep or whatever. Um, 
so yeah great fun but when I think back to that I think how similar some of the plots were perhaps to a comedy show without us meaning it to be you know you would have the villain and the lovely young girl and you know all of that stuff um, and then of course panto pantomime in England is a very very big um, thing at Christmas I don't know do you have that in America at all does it translate uh, not exactly no. No. some pantos no. show up here I just saw a panto where they used Snow White during Christmas as a, a theme, and it was hilarious. That's a panto. Uh -huh. That's a pantomime. It, it yeah. was Cincinnati has a theater that does one every Christmas. Yeah, and the yeah. word panto comes from from comedia, doesn't it? Ali, a pantomime. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's pantaloni. Pant when the French comedian, so when the Italian comedians were in Paris using lots of men of stage machinery and doing magic stuff, the English kind of stole the idea but didn't understand French. So they thought, right, lots of magical transformations and they sort of stuck it in a fairy story mm -hmm. and they had Harlequin having a chase through it. And after a while they went, what the hell's Harlequin got to do with this? This is just, <laughs> you know, and they kept the fairy story. And yeah. you know, being English, they, you know, a bloke in a dress was funny. Um, oh yeah, always. Yeah, the bloke in a dress was funny. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, yes, yes. and. Yes, and it was originally called a pantomime because a lot of it was done in mime and a lot in silent gesture, but that's yeah. um, in the days of Joey Grimaldi and things like that. You know? Yes. So, weird bit of history. Weird bit yeah. of history. Now, the they had a Harlequin thing... dancer up to the 1950s. So. A Harlequin what? They had a Harlequin and Columbine would do like a ballet number. As oh, the yes, yes. In the, the, in the diamond uh, yeah, in outfit. All the, in all the pretty yeah. stuff. Yes. So the other thing that struck me when I was thinking about it was how much the story of Shrek, you know, the film, has taken perhaps from all of this. Um, and regards what J Jay was saying about um, selling a show. So my ideas on that were that social media. So social media usually in this country, anyway, in England, every little area has its own social media local grouping. And if you can get find the leader of that, the person that puts the stuff up get your show put on that and it gets to everybody in the local area. Also community newsletters, if you can find them, and local mailing lists, because again, it's an English thing, but we have postcodes and people who want to advertise to that postcode can pay to put stuff in with the postman and he'll bring it to all the houses in the area. Oh, that's Some neat. houses will say that they don't want, no publicity, thank you, but most people will get some leaflets that come through that way. Oh, that so takes printing, those are my though. contributions. Sorry? That takes printing. You have to yeah, think ahead and print those and, and, yeah. then, uh, and then hand them out. But, but the, the, uh, the yeah. social media works. I, I, I like that idea. Yeah. So my, daughter is actually, kind of yeah, um, my daughter's in a company which is going to Edinburgh and setting itself up as a sustainable theatre company, making sure that everybody is being told to bring their own bottles and that the company all has their own bottles rather than getting plastic stuff. And one of their ideas is to get people, but Ollie has a, <laughs> Ollie has a comment on this, to get people to take a photograph of their leaflets. Because in Edinburgh, you walk down the street and you're bombarded by people giving you leaflets all the time. And you walk away with piles of leaflets and then m many times drop them in the bin. So, you know, people could be encouraged to look at it a different way. So you advertise your thing to them and say, here, have a look at this one leaflet and take a photo of it. But Ollie says that that costs more. <laughs> so, no, no, well, which Ollie? Oh, you're you. Ollie. Me. <laughs> oh, no, actually, we did this in a show in Manchester. We did this as a, as a gag in the show. That basically mm -hmm. The town planning officer stopped somebody leafleting in the show and basically right. tried to get the picture shared among the entire audience during the show. Brilliant. And it was brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Because ev yeah, yeah. everyone's Bluetoothing but, each other in the audience and just causing what were chaos. You, saying about, you said something to me, sorry, Ollie and I go back a long way. We haven't seen each other for about 40 years, but we know each other from <laughs> university days. So yeah. I, I went to Bristol University, he went to Exeter, um, and his, his course was very much designed to lead into this kind of theatre, whereas I went to a sort of more academic, more fine upstanding theatre place and ended up doing this kind of theatre. <laughs> but um, yeah, you said something to me about um, if you take a picture of something, you're using more energy than if you make a leaflet. Uh, yes, sometimes. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I need to. Yes, yes, I need to do the research on that, actually. Oh. 
that's yeah. this if we're really but I just like to say uh, pick up on the sustainable thing. The great thing about Commedia is it is sustainable and it is it's very eco because you use the same costumes, you use the same mask, you use the same characters in every right. single show. Yes, um, that's true. Yeah. Um, Recycled uh, characters. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Well, and that, and, yeah. I, and I think that's without being less than flippant, you know, it is, it is, you know, it is a, you know, it is a thing. It is a thing you can say. And also, uh, you use the same actors because when I worked with Carlo Bosso as well, yeah. and he said to me, he was telling me that the old yeah. troops, you would play your character until you outgrew it, and then you would go on to the next one. So he was Harlequino, and then he became, I don't remember which one, one of the old characters he in played later Pantone life. When, because Ferruccio Salerio died. I thought it was Pantone, yeah. He's still yeah. not dead. <laughs> <laughs> Is he still doing it? Yeah, yeah well, no, no, no he, I think he officially retired, but there's only been three. There was Moretti, yeah. there was you know, Salerio, and, um, and there's now Enrico Bonavera. So since 1946, right. there's only been three. Well, there's been a few sidekicks when Soleri didn't want to do the Japanese tour. Um, right. Is this Piccolo Theatre? Yeah, this is Piccolo. But then yeah. the See, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank but you very much. We, no, 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 Amanda, you can stay, please. I want you guys to be able to chit chat. So I'm just gonna wrap up the recording for the sake of our International Commedia dell'Arte Day webinar, and then we can keep chatting because connecting people throughout the world on this amazing holiday is really what we're all about. So uh, I have to say that this was also my mother's birthday. <laughs> oh, happy birthday. Happy yeah. birthday. So I want to ask you to do one thing. If everybody could put their hand up and wave to the camera, I'm going to take a still picture and smile real big as if somebody just said something funny. <laughs> oh, you guys are great. That's just perfect. I love you. <laughs> Awesome. All right, I'm going to share this as like a, a picture of, um, of us on this auspicious occasion. Auspicious. Auspicious. All around. And uh, so we're good. And I'm going to end the recording. So happy International Commedia dell'Arte Day to everybody. And we are going to make this available on eforenzi.com. So Yay. everyone is talking. Good. Bye, my book. Happy, happy Canadian today, Dave. <laughs>